Hello, everyone, and welcome to today's live broadcast, Robots in Research, presented by Mike Simpson, founder and CEO, One World Lab. I'm Julie Simaroth of LabRoots, and I'll be your moderator for today's event. We are delighted to bring you this educational web seminar presented by LabRoots and sponsored by Boster Bio. For more information about our sponsor, visit bosterbio.com. Before we begin, I would like to remind everyone that this event is interactive. We encourage you to participate by submitting as many questions as you want at any time during the presentation. Just click the green Q&A button located in the lower left of the presentation window and type your question into the box that appears on the screen. We'll answer as many questions as we have time for at the end of the presentation. For questions not answered today, we will follow up with participants via email. Also, please notice that you will be viewing the presentation in the slide window. To enlarge the window, just click on the icon located on the lower right of the screen. If you have trouble seeing or hearing the presentation, please click on the support button at the top right of the presentation window. Or use the Q&A button to let us know that you're having a problem. This is an educational webinar and thus offers free continuing education credits. After the webinar is over, please click on the CE button located in the bottom left-hand corner of the webpage and follow the process of obtaining your credits. Please join me in welcoming Mike Simpson. I will now turn the presentation over to him. The rise of the robots. And indeed, the robots are coming. Frightened or not, you better be ready. One of George Orwell's famous quotes from his novel 1984 is, who controls the past controls the future, who controls the present controls the past. We are in a time in history where it is being rewritten with a frenetic pace as new discoveries are being made at an accelerated pace in all disciplines. The philosopher Terence McKenna described this time period as infinite novelty in his book Time Wave Zero. So here we are, no, in no other time in our history where so much of the future is unpredictable. However, in the future there is one thing we can be certain about, and that is robots will become more integrated into our lives. So this presentation is actually to show how the rise of robots in research is going to be really beneficial for humanity. And the day that we see a bunch of blinking lights and robots in our labs will be a great advancement for science. As Julie said, I'm Mike Simpson, founder and CEO of One World Lab. One World Lab has been a distributor for a growing number of antibody manufacturers over the past five years. With a new collaboration between One World Lab and HTS Resources, a lab automation company, we are able to turn antibodies into microarrays for multiplex assays. And so to do this in our journey today, I will show you how we need automation in order to make microarrays. I will present the automation solutions we use for array printing, a non-contact dispensing of biomolecules onto activated surfaces like nitrocellulose with picoliter precision and array scanning, the ability to analyze the arrays with high resolution throughput and the ability to get ultra-sensitive detection. I will also cover 3D printing, an additive deposition technique used for rapid prototyping and how we have used it to innovate in the array printing business, as well as how it serves as the framework for our lab bot. Finally, I will cover how lab bots will enter our lives through the Internet of Things and end up saving us a tremendous amount of time in the field of research. These programmable automated instruments are the, on the rise, and my goal is to show you what it looks like and why we should welcome this future. So here in, in the array printing that we will look at is the Gessam Nanoplotter, which is the system that we use. Gessam is a German company with a suite of automated solutions for different applications. And the Nanoplotter is specifically unique with its piezoelectric pipette tips that give it precise control over dispensing of liquids. It's fast and it has low CVs between the inner and intra slide printing. It also has a very large capacity slide bed that can be chilled, heated, and removed. 
It has a stroboscope that allows for flight detection of droplets. So in real time, you can see these little picoliter amounts of droplets touching the surface. This allows the fine tuning and optimization of the pipetting to get the desired amount per spot. There's solenoid valve dispensing, which allows for larger volumes of liquid to be dispensed to, for applications that require it. And accessories like the chiller and humidifier are required in order to do microarray production. This is the workflow schematic that breaks down what happens with the nano plotter. It shows that system fluid is used to aspirate up the sample, and then the piezoelectric tip is used to dispense the sample into these high density arrays. The piezoelectric tip is washed internally and externally between runs, even using the piezoelectric tip to sonicate the tip for additional wash value. The laser scanning that we use is the TCAN power scanner. And when you have printed out a large batch of arrays, what you want to do is scan those arrays as quickly as possible. The power scanner is a high capacity, high throughput system. As the video explains, it allows us to process 48 slides simultaneously. More importantly is that it can do this quickly with proprietary high speed data transmission with a two fluorescence detection at the red shifted Psi 3 and Psi 5 channels. So we have a dual detection system that goes down to a two micron resolution using a dual PMT for additional sensitivity. And remember that each spot is about 100 microns in diameter. So at two micron resolution, that's 50 pixels per spot, which is incredible sensitivity. Uh, the suggested amount of pixels needed to analyze uh, with confidence is 10 pixels. So you can see that the system can go above and beyond what is required. And dependent upon your application, you have the flexibility to go even down to lower ranges of detection using a 16-bit imaging system that has a gain which ranges from 0.1 to 1,000 which allows you to increase signal intensity at uh, log five scale. So when you look at the laser scanning, what it does is that this high end piece of equipment captures the images of the fluorescent dots. It's able to measure the intensity, the, the fluorescence intensity, and convert it into a numerical value, which can be interpolated into a standard curve and used to quantify biomarkers and samples. So these are all state-of-the-art devices that we use to do our microarray service and create microarrays. And each one costs 150000 each to be able to implement in your lab. So it's a very huge capital expense to overcome for a startup company. And as a startup company, we're always looking for more affordable solutions to be innovative, to be able to manufacture and produce things cheaply. And that is where 3D printing has come to create the third industrial revolution, an open hardware, rapid prototyping machine approach, which allows us to cheaply and quickly do 3D printing or rapid prototyping of different devices. And the, the, the type of 3D printing I, we're talking about here is RepRap. So RepRap is a more open source software and hardware platform that has this concept that one of these RepRap 3D printers can reproduce itself. And while this is not entirely true, it is very affordable in order to create lab equipment, uh, to try out uh, different uh, devices, to replace uh, pieces of equipment that you'd have to buy. All this can be done with a 3D printer. In fact, this is being used uh, at the consumer level where a family that uses a 3D printer to replace just 20 household items in a year could save up to $2,000. And we've taken this approach in one specific application, which is the arrays. So we've been able to use uh, 3D printing to reverse engineer the nitrocellulose slides that uh, we typically are using. So the price for one nitrocellulose slide is about $30. By creating a slide casting station, that allows us to coat a monolayer of agarose on a slide 
so that we can do the same assay, but with a surface that costs pennies to the dollar. You can see how we used the casting station with the clips and to run this assay and later scan it to prove that you can get the same precision and spot placement uh, is proof that you can do this type of innovation, this rapid prototyping, and produce very valuable data quickly and affordably. And the next thing that is on the rise in, with, in really 3D printing and in relation to that is the, the bioprinting. So 3D printing and creating bioscaffolding is a very hot area. It's, it's becoming more and more popular. And in orthopedics, there's a substrate called flexbone that can be printed into a matrix which can fit into a void of a bone. It stimulates the regeneration of new bones with hydroxypatite while releasing antibiotics to prevent infections. This is being used for generating vasculature and organs de novo uh, right now as so people are printing out veins and uh, little livers uh, using this same type of technique. So this is shaping the future as we know it. And there's no way that this could be done without the use of automation and robots to create these tightly interwoven biological matrices. And so everything that I've talked about, all the technology I've really spoken about thus far, is robotics, automation uh, that is being able to provide value in, in labs across the world and in our lab as well. And the hottest startups right now are, are manufacturing robotic solutions to, to help in the manufacturing processes in all industries. And they're all incorporating the Internet of Things for ultimate connectivity, efficiency, and functionality. So here's a diagram of the Internet of Things, which is simply the connecting of devices to hopefully create human value. So the Internet serves as the network that connects these devices. We are using Node.js and Node.red as programming languages that connect our device to the Internet. And these devices can be monitored anywhere with the appropriate web address. The device, what it does is it captures data. So the robot would be analyzing data. It's sending that information, that data, to another database for analysis. So it can then have the database or what other uh, connected uh, software to send instructions back based on the analysis to the device. So the device can continue doing what it's doing. It can change its operation or stop entirely what it is doing based on the command. So for us humans, it means efficiencies and traceability throughout an entire process like we've never experienced before. And here we see the LabBot 3D. What Richard Rouse at HTS Resources has done is absolutely extraordinary. Richard is an inventor, engineer, programmer, and biologist who has reverse engineered many of the features and functions of the instruments I presented earlier into the LabBot 3D seen here in an animated GIF. He has invented his own proprietary method for high throughput scanning and data capture that replaces the power scanner. He has reverse engineered the piezoelectric system for doing picoliter dispensing with his own stroboscope technology for real-time droplet detection, replacing the nanoplotter completely. Since the LabBot 3D is built on RepRap framework, it can also incorporate a module for 3D printing so that you can now use it as a bioprinter. And as you can see from the animated GIF, it has a moving slide bed conveyor system that gives it a higher throughput capacity than the nanoplotter which takes up twice as much space. So looking at a little bit more of the details of the LabBot 3D, you see it does have all the functionality of the high-end equipment, but it's contained all in one robot. So the footprint here is a, fits inside of a three-foot by three-foot space and again has greater capacity than the nanoplotter to do larger batch runs and even has more resolution and innovation in the motorized conveying bed system and that those motors rely on a core xy motion with linear encoders for feedback which allow for micron step resolution again the 
spots that it is making are about 100 micron in diameter, and the motors can move in 2.5 micron steps, X and Y, or 1.25 micron steps up and down in the Z axis. That's incredible. There's innovation in the syringe pump and the three-way valves to add another level of precision in the liquid aspiration and dispensing. So the, go, the picoliter ability to control your solution, your precious biomolecules, is enhanced in this robot. And of course, it's connected to the Internet of Things so that you can notify via Twitter when your robot should start and stop, and it can then communicate to you when it has completed a run finished analyzing samples, and needs to order more reagents. So here we have additional resources. The most important innovation here is affordability. Instead of hundreds of thousands of dollars to get started, this LabBot 3D costs a few tens of thousands of dollars and replaces the need for several pieces of equipment that require additional maintenance costs. So this is revolutionary for small companies and, and academic labs to be able to start using automation and save a tremendous amount of time and cost. To learn more about the LabBot 3D, please visit the HTS Resources website listed here. To become involved in this community, please visit the San Diego Robots and Research Meetup Group. And then if you are interested in ordering products, you can visit arrays1.oneworldlab.com. And what I'd like to summarize is that, uh, you know, through all of this technology that we're using today and what I'm showing you how it is improving, that we can agree it means to have what it means to have robots in research. It will mean that world's brightest minds are no longer consumed with the menial tasks of pipetting, blotting, and scanning. There will be a lab bot to take care of basic lab routine, analyze data, and order products. The bright mind can now spend time on critical thinking, expanding projects and networks, and solving complex biological problems that can save lives. Thank you again. I'm Mike Simpson, and feel free to contact me regarding any information presented here. Thank you, Mike, for that informative presentation. We will now start the live Q&A portion of the webinar. If you have a question you'd like to ask, please do so now. Just click on the green Q&A button at the lower left of the presentation window, type your question into the box that appears on your screen, and click on the Send button. We'll answer as many of your questions as we have time for. If we are unable to get to your question, we will follow up with you via email after the presentation. Let's get started. The first question is, what operating system does the LabBot 3D have? System. And so we are uh, it's running on Ubuntu and allows for us to not deal with licenses or uh, really allow for more of a collaborative uh, framework to to uh, again uh, really encourage more developers to build out applications on the operating system. Great, thank you. The next question is, where can I buy one? Uh, 3Ds are being developed at HTS Resources, and uh, through our collaboration, I can be contacted. Um, you can directly reach out to Richard at HTS Resources for more information, or, or work with me in order to get a, a quote which, of course, the uh, other. We'll wrap up with one last question, and that is, do you have any patents? Around the, the movement on the conveyor system, the slide bed system, there's patents on the, the way that there's an algorithm for scanning the slides, detecting the, the the signal and then converting that intensity into a numerical value for quantification. So those are all patents, but several more 
uh, that have um, are kind of waiting to be filed. But there, there's definitely a, a lot of, of innovative technology with a few patents behind them already. I would like to once again thank Mike for his presentation. I would also like to thank LabRoots and Boster Bio for making today's educational webcast possible. Before we go, I want to let everyone know that today's webcast will be available for on-demand viewing through August 24, 2017. You will receive an email from LabRoots letting you know when this webcast will be available for replay. Please share that announcement with your colleagues who may have missed today's live event. That's all for now. Thank you for joining us. We hope to see you again soon. Goodbye.